Hi everyone, my name is Justin Wilson. I am the Senior Director of Communications here at the Institute for Justice. And today I'm joined by a, an author of a report that we've just released called Does Forfeiture Work? Evidence from the States. His name is Professor Brian Kelly and he's a professor at Seattle University. The report looks at data from five states and examines the central question of does civil forfeiture actually fight crime or does it just raise revenue? So Dr. Kelly, can you sort of give me a uh, top level findings from your report? Sure, Justin, and thanks for talking with me. I'm very interested in this topic. I appreciate the opportunity. The top level findings are in three groups. First, uh, I looked at whether forfeiture indeed uh, results in more effective policing. And by effective policing, I meant do police clear more serious crimes, that is by arrest, when there is greater forfeiture revenues to work with. And top level there was no, there is uh, no overall evidence that that's the case. That we should explore that a little bit because there's a couple sub findings there that I think we'll want to talk about. Second top level finding, does forfeiture reduce illicit drug use? That's being one of the main stated purposes for forfeiture. No evidence whatsoever that greater forfeiture leads to lower illicit drug use. And the final finding kind of flip things around and ask, well, what does lead to forfeiture? Why do police agencies engage in it? And what I tested was whether local fiscal stress, that is uh, difficulties in gaining revenues through normal taxation, implies greater use of forfeiture by police. And that was a very strong finding that increased unemployment rates locally lead to increased forfeiture by local police agencies. So three main sets of findings there, Justin. One of the things that we've talked a lot about civil forfeiture is that incentives matter. That when policymakers give police an incentive to self-fund themselves, to use a supposed crime-fighting tactic to raise money for their department, it creates an incentive to police for profit rather than for justice. That is to say that they would rather find new revenue sources for their department rather than actually solving crime. And this study really tackles that central question. I think it does. Uh, the first thing I will say is I'm an economist and a statistician. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at uh, comparing data and com looking at mean tendencies and variances around those and all that sort of fancy stuff. But what I did find was that the mean that is the average effect of local fiscal stress on um, uh, policing for forfeiture is very powerful. Now, I want to say up front, this does not mean all police agencies do this. Uh, so we're looking at a large number of police agencies, a very large number of police agencies in this report. And many of them would probably be very surprised to hear that some agencies in fact increase their use of forfeiture during uh, times of budgetary stress. But on average, that's what we're observing in the data. I think that's an interesting point because we oftentimes hear from those uh, you know, police uh, officials that try to defend civil forfeiture that there are quote unquote safeguards in place to prevent abuse and that of course you know most police officers don't do this. And what this report looks at and what we have seen from all of our work in the field is that you know this is not an issue with every police force, but rather that there are some that do engage in policing for profit and that the safeguards don't seem to work. It certainly is true that um, state safeguards on local police are often circumvented, and that's been documented extensively uh, because of equitable sharing with the fed federal government. But also um, what we need to remember is that the data tend to be very poor. Even if there are state restrictions on local use of forfeiture, often there's very poor reporting from localities to the state about how forfeiture is used and so forth. And indeed, local police themselves may have a rather uncertain grasp on how much is being forfeited, what kind of property. So restrictions are difficult to apply. Um, you have, what is it, over 20,000 police agencies in this country, and it's a very, very decentralized system in, in general. So restrictions, some, there are some state restrictions, and states are trying, are, there's many state reform efforts underway right now, but their efficacy is going to depend on good data gathering. So this study looks at 
just five states, but for obvious reasons has nationwide ramifications. Um, I guess, you know, speak about those nationwide ramifications about the need for greater transparency in all of this and why we really only had five states to look at. Uh, let me take the second one first. What guided our choice of states was that um, the five states in question did have active use of forfeiture by police. Most states do, and these five did. And second, uh, frankly, that's where we were able to get the data. Now, that's... Um, that speaks volumes in itself. Why only five states? Well, only five states had data gathering from local and state police agencies strong enough to allow policy assessment. That's a striking statement. I mean, forfeiture is an uh, important policy, uh, policy issue and becoming more so. And yet most state lawmakers don't have the data with which to determine whether it's working or not. So, that's how those five states came to be. The national ramifications, well, the uh, choice of the five states is effectively random as far as we know. It's the states that have good data, covers a wide geographic area, and also covers a very large number of police agencies. So there's a, a good deal of randomization that way. And so with most states having state and local forfeiture very actively, being able to study the impact of forfeiture from five states that actively use it gives, gives us a very strong um, basis for making inferences more broadly than that. Long answer, but basically we have a pretty powerful data set going here. You know, long answers are important answers when it comes to such complicated issues, but this study really boils this down to a very simple idea, which is that forfeiture doesn't fight crime by the measures that we're using, and at the same time, may be used instead to raise revenue. And so in state legislators across the country right now, they are considering forfeiture reform bills and police officers and sheriffs and others show up and they say, you're going to get rid of a vital crime fighting tool. And they very rarely supply any kind of data to actually substantiate that. And so your study comes at such a fascinating time that we're having this national conversation, you know, what do you think the ramification for policymakers should be? The policymakers are being told that forfeiture is a vital tool. And this isn't just at the state level. We've been hearing this at the federal level for 35 years now. And so the policymakers, state legislators and others need to be asking, uh, where, where is the evidence? And what, how do you mean it's vital? And what's your evidence for that? One version of vital crime fighting tool is it prevents fugitive assets. It prevents people from liquidating assets that are, let's say, the proceeds of criminal activity. Well, you don't need forfeiture for that. You might need a seizure statute, but you don't need that money then to be forfeited. And in particular, you don't need it to the revenues from that forfeiture to go to the police agency that's doing the seizing. That's what creates the conflict of interest that concerns critics so much that the very agencies often that seize the asset then get to keep the proceeds if that as asset is eventually forfeited. So there's no particular need for for forfeiture revenues to go to the seizing agency for forfeiture to be a vital tool in policing. It's, there's a disconnect there that um, policymakers should address. And they have in some states, as you know. We actually filed a lawsuit in Indiana because the Indiana state constitution says that forfeiture proceeds are supposed to go to the state education fund. And yet law enforcement wasn't doing that. They said, well, we should be able to recoup our investment in the investigation. And so once we pay ourselves back for all of our time, we'll send the remainder to the state. And then it turns out very little or none would ever actually get sent. And so more and more state legislatures are looking at decoupling the incentive structure so that it does not actually have that feedback loop that creates what your report seems to find. Right, it's, it's important. The, the single reform that would, I think, reduce criticism of forfeiture uh, most quickly would be that decoupling, that the revenues not go to the uh, seizing agency. Well, I want to thank you for your time and your re research in this area, and uh, I look forward to having conversations about this in the future. Well, Justin, thanks for taking the time and talking with me about the work.